Roy sets out to fish the more traditional loch style on the olive hatch. He fishes a team of three flies simulating various stages of the emerging nymph or dun. Generally, he follows the old guideline of bright fly, bright day, dull fly, dull day. It's important to fish olive patterns slowly. The tendency is to fish them much too quickly. See, the way these girls are performing ahead, in anticipation of the hatch, wave and brightness. He believes the form and size of the fly to be vitally important. His point fly, a size 12 or 14 nymph imitation, is an actual nymph pattern or a very slim wet fly pattern. The middle dropper, a slightly more bulky wet fly pattern, and on the top dropper, a more bulky fly such as an olive bumble or dry fly variant. He keeps a close eye on gull activity to tell him where and when the fly is hatching. The variation in color of these olives is quite extraordinary. You need to have an extensive range of patterns to match the hatch. In the early days of summer, the Irish landscape is transformed. The warm, wet weather of early May changes the countryside into many shades of green and yellow. It's Mayfly time. With it comes the annual Festival of Angling, the pinnacle of the Irish trout fishing season. The Mayfly is up. The call goes out far and wide. The faithful return year in, year out to renew acquaintances and reminisce on times past. Small communities awake to a buzz of activity. Local competitions which have run for generations bring anglers together from all over the world. This is the time to discuss what might have been, if only so on and so forth. Great stories of big fish missed, tales to be told. A time when whole families go fishing and not just the dads. So what are the tactics for tomorrow then? What flies shall we use? Who won the cups? What prize shall I choose? <laughs> the life cycle of the Ephemeroptera is of immense importance to the angler. Eggs are laid on the water surface and sink rapidly to the bottom where they stick to rocks and vegetation. The time taken for eggs to hatch varies from species to species and depends on water temperature. Upon hatching, nymphs are so small they're barely visible to the naked eye. As they develop, these nymphs must molt in order to increase their size. Nymphs may molt up to 30 times, changing size and form each time until finally they're ready to emerge as a dun. The mayfly nymph, Ephemera danica, normally matures in two years, but most other species mature in just one year. Trout feed eagerly on the nymph as it rises to the surface to emerge. 
When the flies leave the water, their future is determined by wind strength and direction. In strong wind, many flies die on the surface. Others make it downwind to the shelter of the shoreline and trees. In calm conditions, the fly may rise high into the sky and is carried far inland, away from the shores of the lake, and widely dispersed. A percentage of flies always seem to make it back to shelter from the wind, sun, and rain. They rest until molting occurs. They shed their outer skin, and the spinner emerges. In warm weather, this may take a day or so, but in cold, wet weather, may take three to four days. The male spinners collect into swarms, usually in the shelter of trees and bushes. Here, the characteristic rise and fall, dancing flight of the males takes place. The female approaches the swarm and flies into it. She quickly attracts the attention of a male, and mating takes place in the air, with both flies tumbling to the ground. After mating, the male returns to the dance, while the female sometimes rests a while, waiting for the ideal conditions to lay her eggs. Each species adopts a slightly different procedure for egg laying. The mayfly lays her eggs in batches, flying against the wind, and each batch is laid by flying down to the surface, pushing her abdomen through the surface film, laying her eggs, and flying up again. The procedure barely takes two seconds. This is repeated over and over until all eggs are laid or the fly becomes utterly exhausted and dies on the surface of the water. At this point, the fly is known as the spent. These modern telescopic dapping rods are a considerable advance in what they traditionally used, which I remember seeing continuous piece bamboo poles with a butt about two inches in diameter when I first came to that carb. And this particular rod is fitted with a section of floss which I normally use on a calm day but I'll see how it performs today. I'm just taking the mayfly that we've just picked. There are all sorts of preferred hooks and equipment for dapping, but really I just use a normal size 8 long shank hook, which I'm putting on. Today, because it's a relatively windy day, I'm putting on three mayflies. A comedy I might just use two. Well, some people like to whip some thread onto the shank of the hook to keep the mayfly separated out. Um, and now the idea is just to let this float off in the wind and the piece of floss which is on the line acts as a spinnaker. It just depends. If it's if it's too active I'll take the, the floss off and just use the normal line. And really all we're doing is just letting the fly drift on at the just get it to quieten down a bit. Sometimes if the wind is a bit gusty I, I remove the floss and I think I'll probably do that today now just see how it settles. braided Dacron line. It's a sea fishing line in fact. I've got 20 pound breaking strain so I usually join them at the double grinner. takes, the idea is to drop the point of the rod to allow the fish to turn down on the fly and then tighten or strike back to set the hook. But people say there's a 
an easy form of fishing. It, it, it is easy insofar as anybody can do it, but the really successful rappers uh, have an uncanny knack of missing little or nothing. There's a fish now just moved ahead of us on the edge of the shallow. If you look downwind, you see the yellow water and the dark. Now it's just on the drop off, the darker water. I've just seen a fish move. And if we can just, I'm maneuvering the boat. This is the great thing about dapping, you just need one hand to dap. So you can maneuver the boat readily to cover fish. You don't have the flexibility of casting, but you can keep her. Uh, you can keep the boat on line to a fish that you see downwind of you. And then it's a, anticipation is the is a great uh, excitement of dapping. You see a fish move ahead of you, and you're, there's a fish outside us now just moved, but I, I'll stick on the one I saw earlier. Um, and when you get a day where the fish are moving freely, as they appear to be today, it can be a, a really exciting form of fishing. It's the anticipation of the take is, is the and being able to control your instincts not to strike too quickly. Which <coughs> Dapping has been responsible for introducing thousands of anglers to fishing. It's, uh, kids can be as successful as dads. In that respect, it's a, it gives them tremendous encouragement to <coughs> proceed to take up other forms of fishing. see a fish somewhere about here now, whether it's still here or not, I don't know. There he goes. And I haven't got him. after moving now again on the edge of the shallow ahead of us just where the lighter water meets the darker popular place for taking fish just sitting in the darker water where flies are hatching off when you get a lot of fly blown and held it across the lake of course fish all over the lake come onto the mayfly but when the fly is getting up and away when they get a bit of brightness and dryness then it's in around where they're hatching and immediately downwind before the fly is hatching that you could expect the fish to be most active. It's just ahead here now where I thought I saw a fish taking. There's a fly that's hatched naturally just between the boat and my fly. Another natural fly ahead of my fly now, which we keep an eye on as well. But uh, there's a fish after taking that fly. Very gentle take. You may not have seen it, but uh, we're heading in the right direction now. So let's see if he gives us a positive take. rain. A shower of rain can often be of assistance to the angler as the fly is less likely to take off in wet conditions and fish are attracted to feed on the surface.
This trout takes the fly on the way up, appears to have the fly, and takes it down quite rapidly. One would have thought this fish would surely be hooked, but not the case. Roy is joined by a black-headed gull and a tern. In the past, terns were plentiful on the lake, but like many other species, their numbers are dwindling. This bird has probably come from South Africa, one of the longest migrations of any bird. Whilst dapping the natural mayfly was the traditional form of fishing at this time of year, in more recent years various forms of fly fishing have grown in popularity. A winter's fly tying undergoes the critical eye of Gilly, Tom, Doc Sullivan. Will they pass the test and fool these corrib fish? Time to test a new rod. Yeah, that'll do. Time to go fishing. A rather breezy day may appear a little daunting to these first-time visitors, but with its many islands and bays, you can normally find a sheltered spot even in the most inclement weather. Roy has chosen to go ashore for a while in a sheltered area of the lake where he hopes to find fish feeding on mayfly, nymphs and duns. There is the occasional spent fly to add to the sport. Here is a mayfly nymph ready to emerge as a dun.